Ah, so, good afternoon and welcome to uh, another instalment of Virtual Harrywood. Um, I've got two guests with me um, who will quickly introduce themselves. Uh, Richard Clark. Hi. <laughs> That's helpful. Tell, tell the people who you are and what you do, for those who don't uh, know. Yeah, I'm Richard Clark. I, uh, I design uh, war games uh, for a living and run uh, two Fat Lardies and the sister company Rise of Its Press, which also is about producing war games. So uh, I'm a game designer, I guess. Okay, and Dr. Harry Sidebottom. Hi, um, I'm a historian, um, Roman historian, um, keen war gamer, got back into it um, eight or nine years ago, having had that midlife pause you do from war gaming when life, work, girls get in the way. Um, and I also write historical novels. And uh, the Warrior of Rome series is probably the best known. Um, that's me, Bri. Excellent. Okay, so what I thought we'd talk about today is the whole process of creating derivative works from history uh, and the pitfalls and, and, and the issues of it. Because I know you, because you essentially, you both do pretty much the same thing in different ways in that Richard writes rules and Harry writes novels. So where do we want to start? I mean, how do, how do, what, where, where, where do you tend to fall over doing this? What's the problems with, with taking history and turning it into, into a, a derivative work? Uh, Rich first? Um, well, I think one of the things you're always faced with is the fact that people have um, preconceived ideas. And if you're attempting to present them something that you're hoping that they will enjoy, um, one of the things you potentially have to overcome is the fact that they may have a very different view of history than you do. Um, and of course, uh, I guess this is an issue that Harry has as well when he is. Um, when, I suppose it's fair to say that when you're doing historical research purely from the point of view of historical research, um, you attempt to find out as much as you can about history, but you, there are lines where you can go so far and no further because information is sadly lacking and the, and the further we are from events, um, the, the more that's the case. However, when you um, are writing a novel, I, I, and I'm hoping this is the case, Harry can confirm this or, didn't, or tell me I'm a fool, um, uh, or when you're designing a game, at some point in time, you have to be prepared to cross that line and say, well, I don't know, but in the world that I am creating, I'm going to come down on this side of the, this side of the discussion, if not argument. <laughs> I don't know how that sits with uh, your experience of uh, of writing, Harry. You know, do, do you find that you get conflict with uh, your view of history and what other people thought they they thought was the case? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, especially with the rivet counters, mm. um, you're always going to run into the people who probably really don't know much about the subject but they know an awful lot about one tiny aspect of it and they're determined to pick you up on it um well one example i had was uh, in several of my earlier novels uh, the, the fourth scythian legion um i happened to notice when researching it that their inscriptions have obviously a regimental tradition of uh, having the four as um four eyes in a row right. not iv yeah and on Got a storm of protests. Since when did Roman numerals change? This man doesn't know anything. Um, yeah, you do come up against preconceived ideas. I agree with everything Richard said. I, I, I would say that when you're writing as a historian, you do come up against those bits when you just don't have any evidence. I don't think it's a complete barrier. I mean, it, you, the way you deal with it is you just have to tell the reader that this bit is speculation. It's based on the important guesswork. But yeah, um, one thing I would say is that I do really think, and I've said it in interviews before, that um, as Mike said, as well at the start, I think writing historical novels and game de historical designing historical board games and war games are actually very, very similar things because you're taking the history and you're then creating a narrative. Okay, it's a narrative in games that guys the players play out and kind of less so when the readers are reading a novel but it's a very similar process indeed I think. Yeah yeah no I think you're right as you say I, I mean certainly 
I, I feel, you know, potentially that, you know, there are several types of, of war game or games and, you know, neither one is right nor uh, wrong. Um, but, you know, you, you, you can get historical games which attempt to span huge periods of history, with, which generally lends itself to competition gaming because you can fight any army over four and a half thousand, four thousand, three thousand years of history up against any other army from the the uh, the same period of time and i think in that situation the narrative is not as important as the basic mechanisms of combat whereas what the, the way i tend to approach it is i like to focus on a very uh, tight aspect of history so for example with the first part of our uh, infamy infamy rules um which of course are a, a set of rules which will be divided into three parts which is a hilarious historical joke. Um, but um, the, what we tried to do there is focus very much on conflict with um, between Romans and, and what they would term barbarians. Um, and the next area is going to be more Medita Mediterranean nations where we're looking at things like Carthage and um, uh, Numidians and things like that. And in that situation, what we're attempting to do is not create that competition game, but very much to create the narrative. And I think that the, as a result, there's a, there's a similarity there that when, when, I'm designing, uh, when I'm designing rules within the, the overall picture of the rule set, I am looking to create situations where a storyline will emerge. So yeah, I think that, I think there's a, a real parallel, um, a real parallel there. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, well, one, uh, sorry, Richard. yeah, please, after you, sir. Um, well, I actually noticed that parallel when I was researching my the new novel that comes out on the first of October, The Return. Mm. Which is said a bit earlier than Infamy, Infamy. Yeah. Um, although, interesting enough, kind of at the same level, that kind of mm. mechanics of combat, face of battle level of the junior commander. Right. And what I did at one point, what, what I did at one point was to um, actually, the, it builds to a climactic battle, the Battle of the Isthmus, uh, the Romans against the Greeks of the Achaean League. Yeah. And I, of course, being a gamer, then got it on the table and played it out. First with Commander Callus Ancients, and then. Um, with my own homebrew rules. And um, once I've played it enough times, I eventually managed to make the narrative of the game vaguely fit the one I was putting in the novel. Took a bit of doing, but eventually I got there. <laughs> there was a, that's interesting, actually. I, I used to do uh, quite a bit of work with, um, in terms of wargaming work, with Paddy Griffiths, the uh, historian who uh, uh, spent a lot of time uh, operating as a lecturer at Sandhurst. And he ran a game back, I think it was 1974, where he ran, uh, we're getting off the topic of ancients here, but he, he ran a, a, a Kriegspiel of Operation Sea Lion. And at the time he had quite a lot of um, senior German and allied officers who had taken part in the planning on the German side, in the planning of Operation Sea Lion, um, and uh, British senior officers who would have been involved in the defence of Britain had the Germans invaded. And he ran that as a war game, which then went on to inspire a journalist to create a narrative uh, in, in a novel uh, based on that game. So it's, it's quite interesting to see that, uh, you know, that the use of a war game to inform a narrative. Yeah, absolutely. And I... I mean, when I set out doing my very first novel, Far in the East, I, it involves a siege, which is based on a siege of a place called Jura Ropos. Yeah, well, yeah I I've read it and really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed all, all that series, the whole Ballista thing, and I love the way you've, I love the way you've tied in the Ballista series um, with, um, oh, the names escape me, but you've, you've got another series with um, the, the legionary emperor, Maximus, uh, oh, the Throne of the Caesars trilogy. That's yeah, right. I tried to try to create a whole universe. Yeah, when I was doing the first yes, one, yes, absolutely. I got... And I love the way that I love the way that after three or four books, I suddenly realised that the two were coming together in one great big Gordian knot. <laughs> yeah, you've got to plan ahead for these things. Um, but yeah, when I did the first one, Far in the East, the first Ballista novel, I actually got a huge archaeological plan of Jura, and then I marked where. Ballista was putting the artillery units on the towers and where the defending units were. And then I put some lines in and lines of fire, lines of shooting, sorry, correct, be pedantic. 
Um, and it only dawned on me afterwards, and I got this thing, if I had added some combat resolution tables and some dice, I was actually really designing a war game, or at least I had the basis, which one day I you know, might go back and try and make a war game of. I mean, they're, they're, they're both very similar sort of creative processes, I think. Hmm. When, when you guys um, have to make that historical, historical to um, fiction decision, do you go informed more by which is probably more likely to be correct or which one fits the narrative and the game better? Uh, um, tough question. Um, I think you've got to do it um, on a case by case basis. Um, some t I usually try and go for the more historically plausible, but now and then it just won't necessarily fit the storyline. Um, what I do then is I usually, I don't usually always have a quite a lengthy historical afterward at the back of the novels. Yeah. And if I have played with the history, then I tell the reader at the back. I think I think it's very important too because. In some ways, I think historical novelists, as historical game designers too, sort of gatekeepers of history, and we kind of got a duty to get it as right as we can. And if if we're playing with it, tell the people who are reading the rules or the novel that we have altered it slightly. I don't know what you think about that, Richard. Yeah, oh yeah, totally. I mean, I, certainly when I'm designing a when I'm designing a set of rules, I actually don't start designing the set of rules until I've done the historical research. But having said that, I've just broken my rule today. I was up in Nottingham this morning and uh, I bought a load of Carthaginians, which is gonna be for the second part of Infamy, Infamy. And I haven't really done enough research yet to decide what's gonna be in the sort of standard army list. So I, uh, I kind of tried to cover all bases by buying a ridiculous amount of everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly uh, as a, from a design process, uh, I don't think it's, uh, well, I can't actually, I can't start off and go, right, here's the basis of a game and now I'm going to shoehorn it back into the history because you, 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 it's basically trying to, uh, you're making a jelly and then trying to fit the mould around it and you, and you can't do that. You have to make the jelly mould before you can pour the jelly in. Um, so I, I try, what a ridiculous analogy, but I try and use the history as the jelly mould and then the game becomes the jelly. I can't believe I've just said that. <laughs> do, you, do you make, make <laughs> historical sacrifices for game balance? Me? Uh, no, 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 not at all. In fact, one of the, one of the things that I, I feel really differentiates between uh, what I do as a game designer and what a, game, uh, and what a historian does is that with, with a historian, you know, you, you have to say that um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. As a game designer, I have to say the opposite. If there's no evidence that something is being used, um, then I have to assume it didn't exist. So, for example, you could say there is no evidence that Romans didn't have lawn mowers and cricket bats. Uh, however, I'm not going to design a game where they are armed with lawn mowers and cricket bats just because there's no evidence that they didn't have them. I have to assume that they didn't. And so, consequently, you, you really need to... Um, stick with what you can nail down to facts in terms of things like military hardware. Some of the things that you have to make presumptions on are the issues of how command and control worked. Um, I mean, there's a big debate about um, <clears throat> how the Legion was structured, you know, in terms of was it broken down into eight-man sections, you know, tent parties and things like that, and, and did you have NCOs and was, did you have a tent leader? Well, I, you know, I, that, that debate continues, but I, I, I don't view it like that, and I, I've had to make a decision at some point how things work. So my view of a centurion is not really of a commissioned officer, it's more as a, 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 warrant, well, it, it, as a warrant officer um, who's come up through the ranks and is not a man uh, always in the, in the major line of battle making tactical decisions, but he is a man who leads by example. So in many ways, the centurion I see as having many parallels with a barbarian leader in as much as he is leading by example and always in the thick of the fight, as opposed to being more of a staff officer and stood at the back. Now that has to be my decision because you know I, I, I can't pick up a telephone and say, hello, Julius, 
um, uh, spill the beans, mate. Um, so some, but hardware, you have to go, well, you know, we have to look at archeological evidence and uh, also evidence in terms of um, uh, things like, um, uh, you know, Trajan's Colon and uh, the, uh, uh, and, and, and the other writers of, of, the, of the, the period as well that back that up. So for example, we look at, we've only got fragments of Varro other than his stuff on architecture, uh, sorry, agriculture, which I'm not madly interested in, but we, we, you know, we try and find what information we can and then uh, in, in the written texts of the period and then look at, you know, artistic representation uh, on um, different things. But ultimately, when it comes to how command and control works, that's got to be me making a decision. But I don't think I'm playing fast and loose with history. I'm basing that on an informed deci decision on um, considering how command and control works through history, because hum human beings are effectively um, not that dissimilar now in terms of the way we respond to leadership than we were 2,000 years ago. I think um, you're absolutely right there, Richard. Um, and I think actually what you're saying points to why the Lardy's games tend to be the absolute opposite of sort of bad, well, my, that's my bad joke, Euro history games where the mechanism comes first and then you get some history loosely slapped on top of it, maybe. And not only do you go back to history, but the thing I really love about uh, the stuff you do is that um, you go back to the primary sources. Oh, and obviously yeah. for more reasons, history you know you've got drill books and memoirs yeah. and you haven't got that for Rome no. but what you have got as you say is a lot of a lot of writing you've got a lot of archaeology and a lot mm. of art all of which have to be dealt with you have to make decisions about I mean we don't the thing about Rome I've always found is that we've got an awful lot of stuff about the army and war mm. uh, with the literature it tends to come from one angle and it's very yeah. much the top-down view of the gen what we tend to lack, we don't entirely lack, but we mainly lack, is the sort of John Keegan face of battle, what's yeah, it yeah. like for the legionary at looking up. I mean, you can get the occasional little bit. Um, one of my favourite little texts is um, the anonymous continuator of Caesar's commentaries who did the Spanish War. Oh, I think yeah, it was yeah, someone... yeah. The, um, the eighth book or whatever, the seventh book or whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. absolutely brilliant. Because I think it was it one of the great Victorians, probably Macaulay or someone, who said, Clearly, the author um, was a trusty centurion, much better with his gladius yeah. than he was with a stylus. Yeah, I've and, uh, seen that. I've seen that. It's a great, but it's, it's that is actually one of the most interesting books because you don't, you're not constantly getting Caesar's spin on it, are you? You get that bottom-up view. You know, he, this guy mm. has a very limited view of the Battle of Munda, so yeah. You know, he suddenly sees the enemy, someone rides along the front of the line, someone shouts out a bit something funny or a bit of a view. Yeah, There's yeah. a bit of fighting. And it, it's that partial view that, well, I think, you know, in a way, that lower level view, you're trying to recreate with infamy, infamy, isn't it? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I think there's some... Um, there, isn't the guy's name Hurtius or something who wrote something about the Battle of Alexandria in... Uh, in the Civil War, uh, with, um, and isn't there some suspicion he also, he was the, the centurion that wrote that book, but yeah, that's very much where we're looking. I mean, I like, uh, one of the things I'm reading at the moment, looking at the, the Second Punic War is uh, Polybius, and it's just fabulous because he isn't a Roman. Now, okay, he, he he's, I think he's, I think he's got a secret toga in his wardrobe, but he is still a, a Greek. And um, when you look at his histories, it's his, his approach is almost like the sort of prototype uh, historian. He's, he's insistent on high quality data. He's saying that a historian should never write about anything unless he's able to interview the people who were there and have a, a, an appreciation and analysis of the terrain. I mean, 60 years after um, Hannibal went through the Alps, Polybius walked the battlefield and it's like, blimey, this guy, is, this guy was doing 2,000 years ago what I'm doing now. But it is really rare to get that. 
I mean, if you read, I mean, I, I love Tacitus. I mean, I think Tacitus is beautifully written, but you have to take into account that he has an agenda when, in Germania when he's presenting the German as the noble savage in contrast with the corrupt Roman. And you have to take into account he's got, he's writing about his father-in-law with a Greek. <laughs> so these things you, you've got, and, and Livy, uh, you know, where does the legend end and fact begin, if ever? So you, you, you've got to be very aware of the, the fact that you are dealing with hugely political animals. You know, Ro Roman society, um, you, you didn't really distinguish between the general and the politician uh, because they were, were, you know, they were all things to all men almost. And their, their, their entire existence was so wrapped up in politics that they can't get away from it in the way they think and the way they write. So you, you do have to be aware of that, but it, you, you can't just look at that and go, well, Caesar is entirely self-serving, so let's chuck him in the bin. <laughs> you just have to ignore some of the stuff where he says, what a great decision I made, I'm brilliant. But you, you can believe him when he says they have fish and chips on a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that kind of true though of almost all your sources? In fact, inherently it's true of any source that they are biased. Yes, in some way or other. Um, yeah. And just backtracking a bit, my Latin teacher would take a great exception to the fact that uh, uh, you, you slandering the author of the, 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 the eighth, eighth book of Caesar as being less, less literate, literate than Caesar, as he used to take gr <laughs> great delight in pointing out all of Caesar's grammatical mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are really these? Sorry, go on, Harry. Oh, it's really interesting what Richard said about um, Polybius and Tacitus, because um, Richard's you know, hit the nail on the head. And Tacitus, I think, is the, the greatest historian surviving from antiquity, but I, I he's an insider Tacitus. writing. He's an insider writing for insiders. Yeah. You actually kind of, it's a quite a tricky text. You have to know a lot about, about Rome, because often yeah. they're not as good as a wink. He doesn't spell things out. Yes, yes. yes. Whereas Polybius, as you rightly say, he's a Greek, and he's explaining the Romans mainly to Greeks. Yeah. And he actually tells you stuff that a Roman wouldn't. Yes. And that's what makes him so incredibly useful for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, abs absolutely. And, also, I mean, and Josephus, that was kind well, of to a degree. Josephus is to a degree, but Joseph, I always feel with Josephus that he's got a debt to pay somebody somewhere, and consequently his writing is, uh, is a bit of a quid pro quo about them not cutting his head off. <laughs> I think that's very, very true, isn't it? He, it's, it's a sort of extended thank you to the Flavian yeah. Ministry for not killing. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> part, of, part of it, surely, is being able to see that bias and view the, view the narrative through the lens, knowing that, you know, um, Polybius has a different audience than Tacitus, or going a little later on, that Gil, Gildas is basically the Reverend Ian Paisley for his time. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, he is. He is. That's fabulous. That's brilliant. Nice. I mean, I think it's either Guy Halsall or John Morris who basically <laughs> said to see him as a sort of spittle flecked pulpit thumper. <laughs> but the thing about Gildas, and, and I suspect about Tacitus as well, oh. is that there's a lot of things that they assume that their yeah, audience yeah, yeah, knows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. You know, Gildas, yeah, name, Gildas name drops leaders, and yeah. you have to assume because mm -hmm. you know his audience must have known who he was talking about, whether they were figures of legend or figures of history. Yeah, Tacitus wasn't writing for us, but despite that, Tacitus speaks to us eloquently and superbly. He, he, really, he, his writing is is worth reading for just the way he struck the prose. Well, the prose and, and the political insight. I mean, he's yeah, yeah. really almost filling out a blueprint or examining um, how can we live under a, an autocracy? Yeah, you know, yeah. How, how can a decent man behave and live once we're ruled by emperors and essentially all our freedoms are gone? Um, he never spells that out. Or Chris, uh, he didn't, that's a great thing about Tassus. It's, it's a hint. He never, there's never big road signs and sort of heavy messages. He's not. He's not a phone flick pulpit thumper. He's no. more an urbane oh. guy, just trying to nudge yeah, you yeah. in the right direction. Yeah. No. Uh, the urbane is a great word for it. Yeah. One of the things I found about Tacitus is, um, at the outset, one of the things that I try and do is, rather than necessarily 
read about the details of the military stuff, which is clearly going to be the nuts and bolts of any rule set. But one of the things I try to do is read around the subject just to kind of create an ambience, the, the wallpaper, if you like, of the Roman world, so I can immerse myself in it and, and understand, try and understand their culture and consequently understand the way that they think about things in a different manner to maybe the way we think about things. And Tacitus is really good for that. You really feel that you're in that sort of political world of uh, a nod's as good as a wink and a, a name drop here is, is worth, um, you know, a thousand sesterce in, in ready cash and whatever. You're picking up, picking up on, but slightly more back towards the warfare side of things. Um, mm. um, I was, I was digging into Harry's um, Harry's nonfiction book, which I'll plug for him. <laughs> ancient mm. warfare, warfare, a very short introduction to which, yeah, I, I've got also, that. which I might possibly also add very dense. <laughs> you get a lot in. Um, there's a couple of things in there that I thought would be interesting things to pick up on. You, you, you do start in the introduction commenting on this modern scholastic interpretation of this thing, the Western way of warfare. Um, do you want to explain that for folks who haven't haven't read the book yet and really ought to? Yeah, um, you'd have to. Um, Western way of war. Uh, well, the phrase uh, was invented by an American scholar, uh, Victor Hansen, in a book called The Western Way of War which was it's actually a very good book. Um, it's about Greek hoplite warfare. And in it, he, argue, he sort of argues that the Greeks invented a new kind of warfare, which was all heading towards open pitch battle, which was meant to be decisive, towards the annihilation of the enemy. And he argues that it's underpinned by a thing called civic militarism, which is... The idea that if you have political rights, it's your duty to fight. Um, but if you fight, then you automatically should have political rights. Hansen then sort of took this from the Greeks and then decided to become, well, rather worryingly, a right wing, very right wing commentator on politics in America. And he stretched this idea to cover out the whole of the West since the Greeks in about the 8th century BC, that apparently every Western state and kingdom and country since has done this. It's an interesting idea. Um, obviously, from the way I'm saying it, I don't think it works because no. basically civic militarism disappears with the fall of the Roman Republic and doesn't reappear to the French Revolution. So a continuity of practice that just misses out, a, you know, 1500, well, 2000 years really, Not isn't really. going to work. But, but it's a very interesting idea that it's a, as an ideal, as an ideology, because the influence of the Greeks and the Romans, above all the Romans, has informed not just military thinking but military practice i think in the west ever since yeah um and that that was the idea i was trying to sort of structure that um little book a very short introduction to ancient warfare around um quite a long way from table war gaming but um coming back to richard's point um i think it's very important that it's great that he does that that you get the sort of the cultural differences that um, mm. trying to link it to what I do as a historical novelist, one thing that impresses me is bad historical novels that get all the, the real, the kit right, the clothes, the food, the, the houses, but make no allowance for the fact that their characters are Romans or Greeks or Carthaginians or whatever, and they all act and think, above all think, in the way we do. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, found, mm. I, I found it immensely patronising, really. It's kind of patronising for the reader. But it's also kind of patronising to the past. It's making them all just like us, you know, nice, liberal, modern Western men and women. Well, I'm sorry, they weren't. And you know, it's, as you said, Richard, it's the differences of them that are almost more interesting than the similarities, I think. Yeah, I think it's um, uh, certainly true that um, in the 19th century and the early 20th century, you found a lot of... Uh, uh, historians in inverted commas who would attempt to draw huge parallels with how uh, the British Empire was, and the Roman Empire had you know were, were almost identical in many respects you know spreading peace the Pax Britannia and Pax Romana and spreading um, you know all that was good to uh, the poor benighted savages um, when in fact of course it, you know that's that's a, a terrible corruption of what was happening in 
in reality it's not true yes there are similarities but it fits where it touches it isn't a, by any respect it isn't a perfect match and i think we we have an obligation when looking at history to recognize the fact that the the people that uh, we are attempting to represent be that in a, in a literary format or in a game um w were not um, uh, you know, a lieutenant in the British Army in, in 2020 or a sergeant in the British Army in 2020 and they fought and acted in very, very different ways. I think that's absolutely right, isn't it? Um, they, they just had a different thought world. And, did, yeah. And if I wheel out one of my favourite anecdotes from mm. classical, any classical writer, it's from Galen, the um, doctor, um, position to the Emperor Marcus Aurelius and he tells a wonderful story um, about his, his father and mother. Apparently his father was a very, very even-tempered guy. His mother wasn't, she was very bad-tempered. She used to bite, slap and occasionally stab her maids when they upset her hairdo. But it, he, he tells a story about his father, he used to rem remonstrate with various friends who lost their temper with slaves. They shouldn't just lose their temper and punch him in the face because it's a very bad thing to do. Now, obviously, as a Western, a modern person, you think, yeah, damn right it is. But then, unfortunately, for our cosy interpretation, Galen goes on, it's a very bad thing to do because you might cut your knuckles really nastily on their teeth. What you should do is send another slave for a big stick, and then you can beat them in your own sweet time, and you won't have lost self-control. And in the entire anecdote, it's all about the slave owner how he should not lose self-control, how he should beat his slaves. There's no hint of any compassion no. for the guy getting the beating. And I think it's a wonderful point though that just does demonstrate what Richard was saying, that these guys were like us in some ways, but utterly unlike us in others. And that kind of makes us always reflect on ourselves as well as on them. Sounds like my wife. Careful. <laughs> 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 one, of, one of the things we were bouncing around discussing this um, this talk uh, on our on our regular club chat was um, one of our one of our members asked a very reasonable question that, that a lot of the sources for this for this period are very definitely Roman, yeah. and and I think Harry makes the point in in the Ancient Warfare book that that a lot of what we have about the Germans and the British are essentially Roman stereotypes. Mm. Um, what where do we get what do we get i mean where do we get what we get about the, the opponents of rome and and the other question i guess is how much does those stereotypes inform how they end up on the war games table well i'm sorry i do apologize do you mind if i jump in here as this was a direct war game question harry um uh, for it, richard thanks what uh, stereotypes is is always a difficult one because um stereotypes tend to be based on a kind of tiny fragment of truth which truth which convinces you 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 know all about the subject when in fact there's only just enough truth truth to, to fool you into believing something that uh, in totem is not the case um so stereotypes always concern me one of the big stereotypes i come across um, when we presented some of the very early playtest games with people saying, but hold on a minute, how did the barbarians win? Because the Romans should win. The Romans were the ones who won everything and therefore they should be winning the game. And you think, well, actually, yeah, the Romans won in the end, but the Romans, the reason the Romans won in the end was that they never gave up. They didn't know when they were beaten, but they, they certainly were beaten on many, many occasions. And to present them as the, the guys who won because they could never be defeated is, is completely false. But that stereotype still remains that the Romans should always beat the barbarians. Well, you know, they, uh, they, they, you know, give me back my legions. You know, <laughs> we don't, there's, there's many, many a list of, uh, you know, large battles that the Romans lost. Um, but when you look at skirmish level, well, they're endless. You only, you know, only have to look at Caesar's accounts of foraging parties that were sent out when he came into Britain that were completely overrun by tribes. You know, they only get a sentence, but you know what he's saying is the foraging parties were overrun by the, the British tribesmen and, and that's it. They got beaten. He doesn't dwell on it because it's not part of his big story propaganda. So you do have to read in between the lines in, in both directions. You know, when um, 
when you uh, look at Tacitus, for example, and he talks about the way people are armed, uh, then you have to look at evidence of weapon hordes which are found thrown in lakes in northern Germany and Denmark, and then draw your own conclusions based on uh, the number of swords by comparison with the number of spears, uh, and then you, you're able to build up a picture, but you certainly can't take anything any of the writers say as being at face value, because as you rightly say, there's nobody in Germany who's writing um, in uh, you know, a, AD 100. Um, uh, that, that, so that the, the story that you're getting is, is very much only half of the picture, but you can back that up with, with other information. When they talk about the tribes crossing the Rhine, well, they did cross the Rhine, otherwise they wouldn't have had the, the battle. So you, some things you have to believe in and other things you have to take with a pinch, pinch of salt. But it's certainly, I, and I guess uh, this, you know, from an academic point of view rather than from a, a, a novelist point of view, uh, Harry has to, to try and throw away stereotypes when he begins researching any, anything in the same way that I have to try and uh, remove stereotypes that it's a difficult thing to do but you, it, there is a discipline to it I, I do find that now I know that I have to uh, have to ignore stereotypes I am quite capable of saying right I, I don't believe anything let's start with a blank sheet of paper I'm, Harry? I'm, I'm, I guess that's part of the discipline of being a historian Harry I, 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 did, I only got as far as 5-0 levels so I can't really comment on that bit <laughs> um I, you know, I agree. I first thing I have to do is throw away modern stereotypes. Mm. But in a way, I'm, and as you, as Mike, you rightly said, you know, we have only ever got one side of the story. Only occasionally in the East do we have even a hint of what the other side thought about a battle. Yeah. But the ancient stereotypes, um, I think, are interesting in themselves. Mm. And I don't think I think we can. They're based on, they have to be believable, plausible to the contemporaries who read them. Exactly. Also, I, it could go a bit further in that I don't think the literature and life move, you know, live in totally separate compartments. I think the stereotypes actually kind of influence the lived reality of the ancient world mm. because all the guys who of a certain level in society in Rome who went out and actually fought and commanded armies and even yeah, were centurions, had actually read these stereotypes. These stereotypes informed the way they interpreted what would happen to them. Yeah. But I think it also influences their actions. They, I mean, there's a, a strong stereotype in Greek and Latin literature that barbarians, very fierce, northern barbarians, very fierce at the first flash, but you know, they lack our true Roman discipline mm -hmm. and they lack true courage. They're just ferocious and they will give up fairly soon if you survive the first rush. Mm. Now that is a stereotype that would have been in the minds of the guys fighting. Yeah. So in a way, it has a historical reality, even though it's a stereotype. I hope that makes any sense at all. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, and actually there's a parallel there, which is the way I interpret things um, like uh, Trajan's Column and the Adam Clissy Monument in Romania, um, is the fact that if they uh, built these things and they were a complete fantasy and not based on anything that looked like the reality, Roman society was militarized enough that lots of people would go, that's a complete load of rubbish. That it didn't, it didn't look like that at all because I was there. So when you look at these monuments, you have to kind of accept the fact that there is truth in them because they wouldn't create a monument that was completely untrue. Those monuments were based on their perception of what happened. Do you see what I'm saying there? So there's, there's kind of a parallel between what we're, what we're, the way we're viewing the two things. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's absolutely right. If you're putting something like Trajan's Column up for a century propagandist purpose, if, as you say, it's a complete fiction and complete fantasy, it will not work. No. You know, the contemporary audience will reject it. No. So, no, there has to be an element of reality in there. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm the, the, the parallel I'm thinking of is that there's a, just opposite, over the road from Number One London, the Duke of Wellington's residence, there's a memorial there to the machine gun corps in the First World War. And it's, it's something that I, I used to uh, 
go and visit because my great uncle was killed serving in the machine gun corps. But that that uh, is a vicar's machine gun with a laurel wreath around it. Well, it is literally that. It is a vicar's machine gun that's been decommissioned and it's still there now. Um, uh, and it has a, a sort of cast bronze laurel wreath around it. And people who are veterans of the First World War would go, yeah, that's it, that's the real kit. And I'm pretty sure when you look at something like Trajan's Column, which, you know, when it was there in all its full glory with all the weapons on there, they would have been an accurate representation of what the kit looked like going into battle. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it might have, I mean, with... with art it might have made the roman legionaries a bit um who would have been painted on the collar yeah. they'd have been a bit the bit more uniform than they would in reality yeah and maybe some of the barbarian things are you know it's kind of tweaked to fit roman preconceptions of what a sarmatian horseman would look like oh, yeah, but definitely. essentially you're right I, I'm, I'm convinced you're right that the um the contemporary audience have to look up and go yeah, that's what it's like. Even yeah, in Rome under the Emperors, it's, as you say, a militarised society. Um, actually, an example that popped into my mind is one of the most unmilitary men you could possibly imagine was Epictetus, the Greek philosopher. And he illustrates one bit of moral philosophy by drawing a parallel with dinner parties in which your Roman host will drone on and on and on about battles on the northern frontier he's been on. So even even the Greek philosopher who, who couldn't get further away in, in in physically or mentally from war is exposed to this militaristic way of looking at things and to conversations about war. I think he even has the retired soldier moving a sort of the salt and pepper pot around to illustrate where. And here's where the second uh, aller of cavalry came in, just over there by the source. And then there's a real lovely anecdote too. But no, I'm convinced you're right there about that. Can I ask, when you're, um, the, the new book that's coming out, um, I'm thinking is obviously several hundred years, 300 whatever years before uh, the stuff you've done with Ballista. Uh, so when you're uh, addressing a new period of history, I guess that you've got the huge drop on me that, uh, you know, you're an academic operating in that sphere anyway. Um, but do you... Um, What's, what's your starting point for uh, writing a novel of that in terms of the historical research? Well, much like you and researching into me, into me, the first thing I did was went back to what contemporary primary sources we had. Mm. And The Return, this novel that's set in uh, mm. the Roman Republic, yeah. it, it features, it has two stories. It, it's uh, one strand is the Achaean War and it's an action military novel. Mm. But that is told mainly in flashback because the, the front up story is the return of the legionary from that war right. to his small farm in Calabria. And he, in our terms, might be considered to be suffering from combat stress. Yeah. But he returns to the farm. He wants to be left alone. And unfortunately, he isn't. He wanders into a sort of Scandi Noir type. Uh, the mm. bodies start appearing in the Sela Forest. So the first thing I went back to and read was uh, Cato on agriculture, because <laughs> oh, wow. I hate the man <laughs> Um I actually can't really recommend Cato on agriculture as a right rattling read, because it is possibly the, one of the dullest books. I mean, it is what it says on the cover. It's a guide to being a slave-owning farmer, and it, it tells you an awful lot about manure. Um, but I thought, yeah, immerse myself in that. The, the, the main character's got to have... The, I mean, he's a smaller farmer than the one Cato's writing for. He's only got two slaves, not, you know, a couple of hundred. But he's got to get back into that sort of mindset. So that, that was the first... Um, that was the starting point. And then, like you, I, I read quite a bit of Polybius and everything else to get myself back from the empire into the Republic. Right. And kept trying to remind myself that my hero and those around him are peasant farmers who've been conscripted into a legion. They are not, as the hero, as Ballista and the heroes of the other books are, they're not professional soldiers. Yeah, yeah. They may be very well trained, but they're guys who come from the farm, they do the business, and then they hope, be enriched by booty, but go back to the farm. And that, 
and, and made I'm very conscious throughout writing the return. These guys, you know, different background to the previous heroes. Um, and that's something I always had to keep in mind, I thought. Okay, so very much along the lines of um, uh, Lucius Quin, uh, uh, Quin, Quintius Cincinnatus then, called from the plough and, uh, uh, and, and then go back to agriculture after doing their military duty as a, as a citizen of Rome. The, the Roman idea, after all, the Romans had this very strong idea that only farmers make good soldiers. Yeah, and if yeah. you recruit guys to the city, they're nasty, corrupt. They become almost Greek, so they'll be lazy, cowardly, shifting. <laughs> they want to hang around in bars and brothels. They, you know, they've lost the antique virtue of Romanitas. Virtues. We're back, we're very, back to you know, period stereotypes again, aren't we? Well, and isn't it interesting how when you look at uh, the reforms of, of Marius that that actually was the outcome that, <laughs> that happened in the end, you know, that they, they, they ceased to be the, the upright, upstanding citizen who's defending the nation and then in fact the, the Roman legions or you know, the Roman military became an institution in its own right that was vying for power because you know, they didn't have farms to go back to. They didn't, they, they didn't have the same buy-in, did they? No, absolutely, and it, to the extent where Greek commentators um, under the empire in, say, 3rd century AD, the period I usually write about, could actually describe the Roman legions as mercenaries. Yeah, yeah. They're not yeah. even Roman at all anymore in, in certain Greek sides. They're just a bunch of semi-barbarian mercenaries, which actually is not that far off the mark by the 3rd century AD. I think that's right. I think that's right. Well, it's uh, um, the... Uh the empire creates more problems for itself than other people create for it in many respects. Going back to our stereotypes, I mean, um, one thing is that stereotypes could probably influence, the Roman stereotypes could influence the other side. I mean, it's a very good point that um, an awful lot of Germanic tribesmen would have served as auxiliaries in the Roman army. They then go back to their tribes, essentially with a sort of technological, cultural transfer. They know how the Roman army operates. And maybe they also took back certain of the stereotypes with them. So the stereotypes that we read that were within the empire might also have actually been affecting the guys outside the empire too. In the way, yeah. you know, anthropologists can affect the tribes they write about it. Yeah. Actually, that's a terrible analogy, but you get where I'm coming from. Yeah. And then there's, there's that lovely um, sort of cameo of Arminius and his brother arguing uh, about, you know, Arminius has ch chosen the, the, the path of against Rome and his brother refuses to go with him. And I, I always think that, that that takes up such a small, um, small line in the histories, but it, it's such a, a wonderful little cameo that makes you realise you know, the, the, the pressures on, you know, that the Arminius, successful cavalry leader in Roman service, has really got it all in the palm, in his, the palm of his hand. And that's clearly what his brother thought. But he, Arminius goes one way and his brother goes the other. So the, the, the culture of Rome is projecting outside uh, the boundaries of, of, the, of the empire. Yeah, it's it's rather nice that Arminius and his brother actually do it in excellent Latin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not quite. I mean, they could have almost certainly would have been able to speak Latin, but um, yeah, it's yeah. quite interesting. That you, you get Parthia and others doing having similar sorts of debates, and they always do it in wonderful Latin too. It's sort of little smoke and mirrors thing that Tacitus especially does. You just yeah. somehow get that these are actually foreigners as they hold conversations in Latin, consisting of nothing but Roman concepts, usually. Love it. Um, okay, um, one of the things I just wanted to ask as we sort of bring this to an end is, is Rich, and, and I suspect Harry can add voice on this, any plans for more sort of second, third century crisis um, for rules for infamy at some point? Um, well, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure where it's going to go. I've, I've started off on a journey and I kind of let journeys take me with them rather than me push them along. Um, so at the moment, uh, the next phase of infamy, infamy is very much going to be uh, the Western um, Mediterranean Rim. Now, certainly that's going to involve 
um, the Second and Third Punic War. It might involve the First Punic War as well. Um, it's going to involve um, North African states own Numidians and uh, the, the you know the people who were allied to Carthage and then became very much part of you know Rome's uh, uh, client states. It's going to involve the Iberians, the Lusitanians. It's going to involve. Uh, I want to do a lot of servile war, slave rebellion stuff. It's going to involve uh, the year of the four emperors. So we're going to get to Roman civil war there. We're also going to get Caesar and Pompey in their civil war. Um, so, uh, and it's going to involve the Greeks, I think, um, to a degree. But that's really, I'm going back earlier, predominantly I'm going back earlier uh, than... Um, the first part of infamy infamy and the third part is then looking at the eastern mediterranean uh with the dacians and all their chums that mean i uh, finally get to use my parthians well you will do exactly that's right uh, and um you know the the uh, jewish walls of josephus and whatever um but where do we go from there well in a way you know having infamy as a book of, book of three parts is is a great joke but it would mean I'd have to stop after three parts, um, when in fact, I don't know, maybe maybe, maybe we'll go further afield. The, the, the more I find that I research, the more interesting I find in these uh, things, and then the more interesting I find them, the more I end up gaming them. So I don't know where I'm going with it, but I know I'm on the, I know I'm on the bus. <laughs> What's coming next for you then, Harry? Um, next for me, well, there's a bit of a link to what, um, where Rich is heading, In it's a Servile War. Next year's novel, which of course um, is already written and edited, is called The Burning Road, and it's back to Ballista, back to the 3rd century AD, and in AD 265, he and his oldest teenage son are shipwrecked on the west coast of Sicily, and unfortunately for them, into the AD 265 um, Servile Uprising on Sicily. Wow. It's um, according to the publisher. This is Gladiator meets the Road. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Everything has to be X meets Y. <laughs> but no, I'm looking forward to that one coming out. I've had a lot of fun writing that, and um, played a few war games of Servile War too. Um, the earlier Republican ones that Rich is talking about. Yeah, yeah. Can I just say I thought your um, your book with Ballista running through the streets of Rome was a, uh, absolutely a fabulous tour de force in terms of the way, you know, you take us away from the world of big battles and into the world of political intrigue in Rome. I thought that was a really, really great shift in the action. I really enjoyed that book. Thank you very much, Rich. You know, I really enjoyed doing, um, that was the last hour. Yeah. I, um, I wanted to, as you say, just have a different, it's not like designing war game rules from a different point of view. I wanted to have, have one man on his own um, in Rome, um, but it dawned on me that I've published some 10 novels on the Roman Empire, none of them have been set in Rome yet. And so I thought I could take the reader on almost a, a cultural tour from their own sofa through ancient Rome. Odd, oddly enough, you do end up running with the list uh, through almost all the big monuments of Rome. Yeah, yeah. And of course, heading, heading towards a big shootout in the Colosseum, as it were, at the end. Yeah, and again, that kind of comes back to the point I was making earlier about really enjoying immersing myself in the in the you know the cultural background of a period. That book really uh, allowed you to get a feel for you know just everyday life in Rome because it was you know touching on the lives of real people and how they kind of um, found this action going on around them. So I really enjoyed that book. I thought it was a tour de force, mate. Thank you very much, Richard. Um, I'm looking forward immensely to playing in for me and for me. Well, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> I don't well, know, so, well, I'm... <laughs> 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 I, think, I think that's probably a lovely time at which to stop. That's about an hour.